Welcome into another episode of Inside Boxing Live. It is the week of June 13th, and I am Dan Canobio. He is former world champion Chris Algieri, and Chris, the boxing world is buzzing, my friend. How are you? Doing great. I mean, when boxing is doing well, you know I'm doing well. And like you said, boxing is currently ablaze. We got great fights, awesome fights that are that are happening, being made, and they're actually living up to the hype. So let's do it. Yeah, let's awesome stop. weekend spent in New York City at our event. And then uh, we all headed over to the Garden. We watched Tifima Lopez pick up a huge win over uh, Josh Taylor. We will discuss that on this show. Uh, we'll talk about Canelo and his upcoming opponents because it's starting to whittle down. And also, very quickly, I uh, just saw Spence and Crawford, uh, their first press conference. They're going to do a bunch of press conferences this week. Um, I loved it. I thought it was the right amount of trash talk, the right amount of respect, and the right amount of hype. Um, I know you saw the pictures of them, them facing off. What did you think about that first presser? They're finally faced off, and that fight is happening. It's happening next month. Well, both these guys, they're such a high level for so long. They, they, they're they used to the media. They're used to press conferences. They also are there. I think they're both really excited to fight each other because mm-hmm. they have they have a foil in front of them. That's a perfect mashup. And I think, ah, dude, I, 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 I understand where they are in terms of how, what they're, you know, where they're sitting in terms of fighting on a guy like that in front of them and being super excited about it. So, yeah, I mean, they're going to they're going to be buzzing all the way until until fight. And it's only going to make them that much better. But um, and yeah, and they're 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 both classy guys. They both will talk shit, and they're both um, are are professional enough to keep it within within the limits. You know, That's these guys I mean. aren't gonna be throwing. They're not gonna be headbutting each other at right. the press conferences. But but they're gonna they're gonna spur on the public just enough and talk just enough trash that it's gonna keep interest and it's gonna build until fight night. There are levels of talking trash. Like Tank and Ryan got personal. It started getting into yeah. things that we didn't want to discuss. We've seen that in boxing all the time. It gets gets into race stuff. Uh, you see. Uh, personal lives this isn't that this is like professional trash talk these are guys talking about oh spence is like i broke this guy's eye and and, and bud is like well i'm the best at, at uh i'm a three division world champ and spence is like well who the hell did you beat at 135 who'd you beat at 140 this is your first real big fight i love that back and forth stuff and them talking about the history is what really got me jazzed up like Crawford's talking about how, you know, there was the Sugar Ray Robinson era. Go up all, up and down all the weight uh, classes, up and down our welterweight. Um, you know, there was Sugar Ray Leonard's era. There was Tommy Hearns' era. There was uh, F- Floyd, Oscar, Manny. Now this is going to be my time. That's what they should really lean into is the legacy of this fight and the history uh, and all that's on the line. And probably the winner will be number one pound for pound. I can't wait. We're going to be at the press conference uh, in New York City. Me and Ronnie are heading over. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Spence Crawford in addition to the other great things that are going on in boxing, uh, it is coming, Chris, and it can't come soon enough. Yeah, and, and it's a fight that lives up all to, to all the height, I believe. I mean, I believe the matchup is that good. Um, I just hope everything everything goes well and they both make it to the ring. They're both healthy and they both fight their asses off because boxing deserves it. And we have a big meeting with the sales department here to see if we will be going to uh, Las Vegas. Looking good. It's looking good. We got to be there. We can't not I mean, be at Spence Crawford. As 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 good as we did for Ryan and Garcia, I mean Ryan and uh, and Tank, I mean, mm-hmm. numbers it really makes sense. It numbers makes sense. Numbers. We're putting numbers up, people. We're putting numbers up. Talking about numbers, um, Tiafimo Lopez is unhappy with the amount of money he got uh, to fight Josh Taylor. Uh, he did get a huge win on Saturday night at uh, the theater inside of the Garden, a upset win. He was the underdog. But right away afterwards on ESPN, he goes on with Max Kellerman, and he says that I am announcing my retirement at the age of 25. Chris, I will ask you, do we believe Tiafimo that he is re- stepping away from the sport? Absolutely not. <laughs> it's, I think it's a listen. I, I I believe you know. Tio always speaks from the heart. I mean, he's, he wears his heart on his chest. He he um you know whatever crosses his mind comes out. He has no filter, and I think that makes him endearing. That's why a lot of the public likes him. That's why I like him. I mean, he's a really really good kid. I know him personally and outside the ring and outside of the media. Um, he's a great kid, and you know, listen, he 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 speaks what's on his mind. And I think after a, a massive win like that. Even though it wasn't physically grueling, those I've been in fights like that. Those emotionally grueling fights that mm. they, they take your spirit after the fight. He said he's like, I'm tired, man. He, I'm sure he is. Training camps so hard. A fight like that where you have to be disciplined for 12 rounds against a very dangerous opponent, it just it it saps your essence. And I think that he was just speaking just raw. And I think he looked back on that and goes. Hey, listen, that was actually a pretty good idea that I said that because I have a really good bargaining marketing chip now that 
I can make some more money. And listen, he deserves it. These promoters need him now. After a win like that, not only do the promoters need him, boxing needs him. And he understands that. He knows that. And it's going to work out to some dollar signs. Is it going to be eight figures like they're <laughs> asking for? Probably not. No, nine right? figures. Oh, nine. Yeah, forget it. Bump I mean, it up no. a few more zeros on that. He he wants like $100 million, he said, because I brought... I brought Disney and top. I mean, he well, says that's dude. Eight, eight, eight figures was silly. Nine is <laughs> like now we're t- what are we talking about? We, right. Come on. Yeah. Stop. Um. But but yeah, even even eight figures is, is silly. So nine is completely out of the question. You're you're not Floyd Mayweather. You know, eight figures is you're not Canelo. So, yeah. Uh, high sevens. Sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, 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 you deserve that. Yeah. He He's smart to feel in terms of keeping the conversation mm-hmm. going. I do think he'll be back in the ring. ESPN is reporting that he made two point three million for this fight, so he said a million. Um, it's definitely more than that. I think he can get even more out of top. Yeah, rank. but you pay New York taxes, and then you pay <laughs> your team, and then you uh, right. training camps are not cheap. So, guys, th- th- listen, a million's never a million. Everybody at home, I'm saying that again. A million is never a million. Well, doubled it, but I mean, he's saying I only made a million when it turns out he made two point three. But I think he wants more, and I think he deserves more. This is a negotiation tactic. Do I think he's tired? Obviously, yes. Like all the things you just said, he also he puts his personal life out there. His very personal, uh, his life is, is an open book, and we know that he is going through a bitter divorce uh, with his uh, wife or ex wife. They have a kid. He had not be able to see the kid. That is coming into play here. But I know for a fact that he's signed to top rank for a very long uh, term deal. Maybe they'll increase the money as they should because look at top rank. They on, on the verge of maybe losing Haney. You know, Tyson Fury's getting up there in age. Better be of getting up there in age. They really don't have that many other stars. I mean, in a way, of, of course, but he, he is fighting mostly over uh, in, in Japan. They need to keep these marquee names uh, around, and Tiafimo is definitely one of them. I think he'll be back in the ring. Maybe he takes some time off, uh, but there's so many big fights for him at 140. Um in terms of in the ring, I thought this was interesting. Like his dad now is getting like a round of applause. His dad is getting a uh, praise um, because he finally realized that his son is at his best when he's boxing and he's counter punching, which he did on Saturday night in that fight beautifully. Styles make fights. Uh, Taylor came in a lot. Uh, Southpaw too, which went, fed right into into Lopez. But it's just funny how it all works. The female last week was a crazy man that on the verge, maybe he shouldn't fight. His dad is ruining his career. Now we're looking at Tiafimo Sr. as one of the better trainers in the sport because he drew up an excellent game plan to beat Taylor. Listen, he's crazy like a fox. They both are. Both both Sr. And, and, and Jr. are both. They're crazy like a fox. They 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 live on the brink of chaos. We've talked about that the last couple of shows. And and you know, listen, at the end of the day, the kid the kid makes it work. I mean, he's a he's a he's a true fighter, but he's also a, a strategist. And he went in there, he executed a very disciplined game plan. When he is dialed in, he's damn near unbeatable. He looked so good that night. You were sitting right next to me, Dan, and yeah. I'm, I'm I'm I was speaking under my breath about what things that he was doing, the things that I was seeing really early on, and I'm like, oh boy. This this kid, I'm like, I said in the second round, I go, oh, he found his rhythm. Josh is in trouble, and if, unless Josh can can stem the tide and change the momentum, which he never did, it's going to be a really long night for him. And it's exactly what happened. Uh, Tio is is a uh, he's a brilliant young fighter, brilliant young mind. I mean, he's 25 years old, 20, 24, 25, 25, 25. I mean, he's got so much more to get to give to this sport. Um, so many more legendary nights. I mean, his his. His pedigree at this point, the guys that he's beaten all, all up, up to already, is just it's crazy. It, it, it almost blows out all the other all, all the other guys around the weight class. I mean, uh, very 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 impressive young man, and and for him to be able to do what he did that night, I'm 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 happy. I'm proud of him. That was that was an awesome awesome fight against a very very good fighter. And I'm taking nothing away from Josh Taylor. He didn't fight a bad fight. He just had someone in front of him that he just couldn't figure out that night. And and Teo was super disciplined and stayed ahead of him and. That happens a lot when you got guys that are that good. If you just get if you get ahead and you're able to stay ahead, it makes really good fights not even that close. So right. uh, that's that's what we saw that night. We saw two really good fighters, but one guy just had a better game plan. He was able to execute and he stayed disciplined throughout, so it made the fight not close. Yeah, you take a look at um, Tiafimo, who is now a two division uh, world champion, two two time lineal champion. Beat Lomachenko, who beat the man. Beat Taylor, who beat the man. That is impressive. Two-time ring uh, magazine champion. That ring magazine belt means something uh, in the history of the sport. But look at it in 2019 on. He beat Nakatani, who was a very tough fight. 
Uh, he Very beat tough. Comey. Knocked him out in the second Huge. round. Lomachenko. No one ever beat him like that. Right. Beat Comey. Lomachenko. Uh, obviously, you saw that. Everyone saw that fight. The Cambosos is the blemish. This is the rough night at the office. Is the outlier here. And then the Campa fight and the Sandor Martin fight. Everyone keeps bringing it up to me when I posted this. It's like, well, he should have two losses because he lost to Sandor Martin. It was a close fight. I thought Tiafimo won a split decision. It wasn't like some like egregious Catterall, um, uh, Taylor type of, of fight. Like I thought Tiafimo won that one, and then obviously uh, moving up to to one forty, finding the best guy there, uh, Josh Taylor. And this is all at the age of twenty five. I mean, I forget that he's twenty five sometimes because you know he has all these personal life issues, like real life stuff. Um, it's nuts. He's putting together a hell of a, of a resume, and I don't think he's going to walk away. I think he'd be very foolish to do so. He's already appearing back on. Pound for pound list, even though I don't agree with them. Ring Magazine, what are you doing having Lomachenko on the pound for pound list still and also leapfrogging after a loss? It's a whole other story uh, f- for another day. But how do you think Tiafimo does at 140 now against some of the bigger names? Like, how would you say Tiafimo does against uh, a Haney or a Progre? You know, if he stays busy, and like I said, when he's dialed in, um, I mean, he's he, like he's damn near unbeatable. I mean, he's he is that good. I think I can see him beating both those guys. I can see him even beating Progre, especially with with the kind of game plan that he had. And he showed he showed good power in the fight. He was able to touch uh, Josh and and hurt him and keep him keep him honest all night long, which I was worried about. I thought that he would. I was really worried because I haven't seen the power at one forty anything that was going to deter world-class guys but with josh he was able to crack him and, and and leave him thinking about shots often and his ability to be explosive and to stay explosive through 12 rounds was very impressive his gas tank was great and that's been an issue for him in the past he controlled the pace he, he's uh, punchers guys like him they need to rest while they're fighting they, 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 they don't fight the whole round. They, you know, he's making his moves, whatever, but he's so explosive. He puts you on notice, keeps you all cautious. And he was able to do that with Taylor, which Taylor is normally a volume puncher and never gets tired and comes forward and throws bombs and, you know, keeps throwing and throws combinations, fights in the pocket. He was completely unable to do that because of Teo's explosiveness and his ability to, to set the tone, draw a line in the sand and be like, all right, you're staying there. I'm staying here. I'm going to hit you. You're not going to hit me. When he's able to do that, he's going to be able to beat anybody in that division, yeah. Progray included. I th- so it, I, with Teo, just put good fighters in front of him. Yeah, He does better. Yeah. Put the most dangerous man around in front of him. He doesn't do he well when up. he's the favorite. No, he does not do well against guys he's supposed to blow out. He doesn't get up for the fight. He needs to be up. I think he needs to be scared. I think he needs to have a little bit of fear in him to make him do the extra work in the gym and to show up on fight night and be really dialed in. Because yeah. when he loses focus, he's just not the same fighter. So yeah, put bring on Progray, bring on Haney, bring on all the Bermudez, bring on those guys. I want to I want to see those fights right away. Don't even give him an easy fight. Keep, I, keep him in tough fights. This is like I'm, I'm thinking the same thing. It's like it's just a matter of him getting up for for big fights because the Cambosos one obviously wasn't he was a huge favorite and he obviously had the worst uh, night of his life and in, in Campa. Uh, he he blew him out, but also Martin. He was in the late replacement, so he wasn't exactly up for for that one. But I actually think that Haney gives Tiafimo a tougher fight style wise than Progre. Because look at Progre, southpaw, yeah. uh, similar style to Josh Taylor, gonna walk right into shots just like we saw um, with with Josh Taylor. I think that Tiafimo can handle Progre. Haney with that jab, uh, sticking in his face, boxing and moving. Kind of saw what Sandor Martin did boxing and moving. I know they're not the same type of fighter, but I, I think Haney gives Tiafimo more issues than Progre does at 140. True or false? Your you Twitter knuckleheads who I think I mean, that Haney is not that good. Try it's insane to me. I have people telling me I know nothing about boxing because the things I say about Devin I Haney. Love that. No, that just shows you literally know nothing about boxing because Haney's uh, his style is so difficult to deal with. That style of fighter, the guy who will be a consummate boxer who will fight at length, who has speed and endurance and can move and is big and long is the worst guy to be in a ring with. It is a nightmare sparring guys like that it is a nightmare fighting guys like that. If you've never been in a boxing ring, if you never got touched up by one of those guys, you have no idea what you're talking about. Mm. So these people who are talking to me about Haney, Oh, he's soft. He's this, he's that. What you just said, him being a more difficult challenge than, than a guy like program. I, I would agree. Because he's he is an enigma. He's a, he's he's a style you have to break. You've got to you've got to be able to work through it. No one's done it yet. Lomachenko was close. He fought a really good fight, but at the end of the day, the scorecards were that close. So, go either way. You know, Haney won the fight. Historically, that's all there is to t- to say at this point. Yeah, but, but no one's figured him out. Right. That brings us to our next topic: is 
for weeks now with these big fights at 135, starting with Tank and Ryan, and then going up to Haney, Lomachenko, and now T-Female Taylor. It's like we're throwing Shakur as well. We're throwing together all these matchups, and we're trying to find what's the right one, what's one to think it's going to happen. It's a great thing for us. It's I love it. It's so intriguing to find these different big fights that are going to sell, that are going to be good fights. But I think the picture at 135 and 140 is starting to become more clear every week or every month when these guys are fighting. To me, I think at 135... Tank and Shakur are going to be there for the longest amount of time and are not going to move. I think that is the fight we can start building towards at 135. Uh, at I one, think, go ahead. Okay. No, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. At 140, I think it's Tiafimo and Haney in terms of biggest names, uh, best type of fight, most marketable. There it is. Ryan and Roley. I understand it's, it's not on the same level as these fights. But it's a marketable fight, and it's another name that uh, that's in the sport in Ryan and Roley, both uh, very popular. I don't know what that means for Regis Progre, who is a title holder, who fights this weekend. I think if Haney goes to match him, then obviously Haney Progre is a, is a really fun fight too. Progre Tiafimo is a fun fight. But I think those three that I just mentioned before that, those are the fights that I think are starting to fall into place as the biggest ones that we can make in the sport at those two weight classes that are now dominating the sport. I'm going to put Progre in a similar boat with JC Ramirez, mm -hmm. who is a very dangerous guy, former world champion, um, has had tough fights with, you know, had a tough fight with Taylor, uh, looked really good in his last couple of fights. He was able to stop Comey. He, he was able to, um, you know, he had a really tough fight with Zepeda, um, which when Zepeda was really streaking. But yeah, Progre, listen, those guys are, they're almost like they're on their way out age wise. They're aging out. Progre's 35. You know, so yes, he's still a dangerous guy. Stylistically, he's still a popular guy, but he hasn't been super active, um, especially at the higher levels. He hasn't really fought a eh, dangerous guy since he fought Taylor. Right. Um, and, you know, getting in back into the mix with these guys at 35 years old, you know, it's 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 a it's a taller mountain to, to climb that way. But they're both super talented guys, Ramirez and Progre. They're both dangerous. They both could get wins over any one of these guys. I just I don't really think they will. But yeah, no, I, I think I agree with you. Tio Haney, it just it's on. It's just it's palpable. It's there. They're both going to be afforded. Both have been coming up. Tank and Shakur. I think Shakur will be able to move up sooner than Tank. I don't think Tank's ever going to fight a forty again. I don't I, unless there's some fight that he's chasing. He won't right. physically need to. Shakur will soon. He's still growing, but I think he has a lot of work to do at thirty five. I, I think he's going to clear out that division, and it's going to be Tank is going to be the final boss for him to 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 take on before he moves up. And then Ryan Roley is basically a glorified YouTuber fight. It's uh, they, they're they're no, they're nowhere near the level of all the other guys that we're talking about. Um, but it's an entertaining fight. It's going to get a ton of eyes. They're going to make a ton of money. It's going to be a really fun buildup. And it'll probably be a pretty fun fight. Yeah. Um, even though I think Ryan's a much better fighter in every way. Um, but it, it it will probably be entertaining. So yeah, it's it, it's it's a glorified YouTube fight. I I think there's room for a Ryan Roley fight because. We're getting some of the fights that we want. Like I say this all the time. Oh, like say like it's same thing. With, no, it's a fun yeah, fight. Right. The same it thing, makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. The same thing with like the Jake Paul theory I was always had. It's like when Jake Paul fights are supplementing like big fights like Haney Lomachenko right. or Ryan Tank or Spence Crawford, then it, it, it finds its lane and it knows what it is. When like a Jake Paul fight is the main attraction on the boxing schedule for the year then the promoters aren't doing their job. Like Ryan Rowley can fit perfectly fine in in December. I don't know if there's going to be a belt on the line. That's we're gonna. That remains to be seen. Like Rowley may have to vacate, which we've talked about on previous episodes. Uh, so that means that the WBA belt might open up. I know Puello is going to get another crack at it, even though he tested positive uh, for PEDs. There's Subaru Matias floating out there, who, like we spoke bad about, dude. very bad, bad dude. Dude, hundred percent knockout ratio, or just bad about. Dude. He has nineteen and one, but nineteen knockouts. Um, no one talks about him, not because. Like he's avoided or he's the boogeyman. He just has zero profile. I mean, he's been around for a while now. He's now a champ. Like you said this on the on post fight show. He's that, you know, high risk, low reward type of fight. Like no one's calling him out. He doesn't even have a promotional uh, team right now. He's a free agent. He has a belt, but like he's kind of in no man's land. He's the one forty pound marauder. He's like he's like yeah. he's he's on the on the the horse like circling the <laughs> battlefield waiting for waiting for someone to fight like he's out there he's dangerous everyone everyone's aware of him everyone's aware he's out there everyone knows he's dangerous um, he's just biding his time and he's being patient but 
Uh, he does, like you said, he doesn't really have a profile. He doesn't, he doesn't um, speak the language so he can really just go out there to take it to Twitter and then go call people out. So yeah, he's in a tough spot, but listen, he's young too. And he's very dangerous and he's got a punch When you got a punch. You're always, you're always there. That's why progress um, should fight him. That's a, that's a cool fight. It's a very cool fight. Like, but well, force I think progress is of... looking higher. I think he's looking for fights that. It's calling he's out Adrian Broner. That... What's that? Progre was calling out Broner over the weekend because because it'll get a lot of eyes. He he's so Matias is da- like you said he's dangerous but not a lot of eyes. No one people non boxing people are not going to care. Broner everyone's going to care. It's silly for him to call him out because it doesn't really help. No, but that just kind of shows you where Progre's mindset is right now. Thirty five years that old, just, just getting to that. Yeah. He's either fighting guys that cannot beat him like we're seeing this weekend, or he's gonna try and fight the tip of the top of the iceberg so we can get that big money which is you know his career recently has been very carefully curated and, mm-hmm. and moved very very smart yeah. um early on he was the marauder he was the guy that everybody knew about that nobody really knew right. about you know all the ever all the boxing people knew about him but outside no one did mm-hmm. and he wanted to fight everybody he's calling everybody out he was what where matias is at now so yeah in in, in the true meritocracy and in, in, in the the goodness of the sport yeah it would make sense that pro gray and matias would fight but i don't know if i see that unless it's forced yeah, I mean, the thing that Matias has is the belt, and that, that does mean something. Uh, as much as fans want to say belts don't mean anything, it, it does. It gets you into these big fights, and promoters want fans control the belts. Yeah. Belts matter. Uh, the, the networks want control of the belts. The promoters want control of the belts. Matias has something. He has some value if he doesn't have a, a, a big profile. Let's quickly talk about Mangia. Uh, Derevinchenko was an awesome fight. Um I caught the replay, caught some highlights back and forth. Holy goodness gracious. Uh, I thought Mangia edged it out in a really tough 12th round. Um, his best win. It also showed kind of the limitations on Mangia. Like, we know he's a great TV fighter. We know that his defense uh, is lacking. But, damn, he puts on good fights. And I think now more than ever, it's time for him for a big fight. But we just don't know, like, what division. He, this one was at 167 and a half. Like, is he a 168-pound guy? Will he try to chase Canelo or, or Andrade or some of the names at 168? Or is he a 160 guy where he can kind of feast on all the chaos that's going on at 160 with not a clear guy? Like, I like Mungia. I want it. He's only 25, which is insane. He's 42-0 and 0 at 25. But, like, there's no plan for him. He just talked about all these young guys and how there's these fights that are now, like, becoming more and more clear. Like, What's the fight for Mangia? I don't know. What like what do you think? Well, it, it's tough when we're comparing it to these other guys because you have they have so many dance partners and he he doesn't you know because he's he's not at the level to jump in there with you know like the Charlos and the Triple G. Is he the, though? I think know. he's ready now. Listen, do I think he's ready? Sure, but like it, it, the, is he is he demanding enough to make those fights happen? No, it's not like these guys. It's not like Tio and Haney and Tank and Shakur. These guys like they they have so much clout. I don't think Mangia does on the world stage, especially, you know, he, he struggled very badly with Derevchenko. Yeah. Not taking anything away from either man because Derevchenko is a, is a, is a badass, but he is 37 years old and Derevchenko had him in a world of trouble. And I believe it was the fourth. Some people round. had Derevchenko winning. Yes. I mean that, that late knockdown was a, a major factor and listen, Mangia looked good that night. We, we were actually watching it while well, I was watching it. In between rounds of the uh, <laughs> sick. Of, the T.O., sick. of the T.O. Taylor fight because it was in front of us and one of the press row had it. I was like, whoa, I'm like, yeah. yo, Derrick Chick almost knocked him out. Um, but yeah, no, it, it was a hell of a fight. It's a fight of the year type fight back and forth. A lot of good action. Um, Derrick Chick put on a, a fight of a, of a lifetime and, and Mugia showed, you know, listen, he's very, very good. And he can hang with some of these guys. But at 68, he was fighting a 60 pounder. Derevchenko is not a 68 pounder. That was his first time fighting above 160 um, in a meaningful fight, and he showed out and, ma- and made it a really good fight. But that's not really where he belongs, and he's 37. I, mean, I can I cannot reiterate that enough. He's 37 years yeah. old, um, and Mugia, like you said, is 25. So, yeah, t- yeah. I don't know. I don't know where he's gonna fight. I mean, Ryder is out there at 168. Uh, obviously, that's Benavides. A, that's, listen, that's a tough fight. He, I like Ryder he versus. Might not, he might Mungia. not be Ryder. Yeah, I like that fight. I like that fight a lot. And, and listen, that's a good call. That fight might actually happen. That fight makes a lot of sense. Um, it's a dangerous fight for Mugia because a loss to Ryder is is a is is a really really tough pill to swallow for for their team. But a win there, especially if it's impressive, it's pretty legitimate. Yeah, that's like in terms of like the promotional like nonsense. Like Ryder fights on the zone. He's with Matt Room. They can figure out a way to make that work. The other guys at 168 are all with the PBC. He's not fighting Benavides. He's not fighting Plant. He's not fighting Morel. Um, I don't think he'll go to 160. I think nobody wants to fight Morel. 
Well, Yikes. Benavides might. Uh, that one, guy's a bad dude. And at 160, you got Golovkin, uh, Jan, uh, Janabek, Carlos Adamas, Liam Smith, uh, Lara, mm-hmm. Danny Garcia are fighting this summer, I think. Um, so, yeah, it's it's weird. Uh, but I wanted to uh, shine a light on that fight because it was an awesome fight. Dervinchenko is a warrior. He might be the most tough luck loser in the last 20 years or maybe the best fighter never to win a world title in the last 25 yeah. years. Uh, so shout out to Dervinchenko and Munguia. Sullivan Barrera is another one. Yeah. Another very, very good fighter who never won a world title. There's a lot of those guys out there. So uh, shout out to them. I know the big story this weekend was Tiafimo and Taylor, but those guys almost stole the the, the shine away because they put on a, a really good fight. Final topic. This one is loaded, Chris. Cano Alvarez uh, revealed that he wants uh, a fall fight, and there were a lot of different opponents out there, none of which are those that we want to see. Maybe you at home want to see uh, some of these ones. But according to ESPN reporting, Canelo is looking at two fights for the fall. Um, Jamal Charlo, uh, I guess at 168, or Badu Jack. Badu Jack, the cruiserweight. And that fight would be at a catchweight. I don't know how that would even work. This is a big, steep fall from a Bivol rematch or Benavidez fight. I actually think he's making the right decision by not fighting Bivol. But, man, he was talking about it so much. He was so steadfast about it. Uh, and with Benavidez, I think Benavidez offered him $50 million, but then Lukowitz also admits that, yeah, we offered him $50 million, but we already have a deal in place to fight Morel. So what was the point of that $50 million offer? Clout? Like, what's going on with Canelo? This is a lot to digest. So I had said on Twitter a while ago when Badu Jack beat um, – uh, what's his name? The uh... – the cruiserweight champion yeah. become cruiserweight Makabu. champion. Makabu. Yeah, I uh, I said, I was like, Canelo beats both these guys, no problem. Why would he knock up the cruiserweight and then go get another title or whatever? Um, I was saying it jokingly, but also I was like, I could 100% see that happening because he beats these guys, no problem. Um, but the fact that they're doing it at catchweight means there's not titles not going to be in the line. No, they are going to figure the... out a way. I That's thought you stupid. might know this better than I would. Like, this 176, this 176 mean... If they do it at 176, that's nuts because because uh, Jack is 40 years old and he last fight was close to 200 pounds. That's what I mean. That's why this is not as like impressive to me as him going up to 175 and beating Kovalev. Like we he just talked literally about, literally just fight him at 200 pounds because he beats him anyway. But like it it it, it delegitimizes it Thank so you. much. Yes. If you if you if you if you whittle him down 15 pounds for what? 25 pounds for what? Just to say you have another belt in another weight class? Like, yeah, you did that already with Kovalev, and you tried the game with Bivol, and, and, and it went too far. Like, you're a five-division world champ. Like, that's fine. Like, yeah, it's five. Like, let's you try to make it six. But especially because he can literally beat him at the weight. I, I'm, I'm telling you right okay. now. I'm watching, I'm watching the fight, and I'm like, oh, yeah, Ken beats both these guys, even at this weight. He's <laughs> he, he is good enough to do that. Uh, but Okay, so he, he goes up to 200 in a perfect world and does it legitimately. We saw this happen with Roy Jones when he went up to heavyweight to fight John yep. Ruiz. What happened? Yeah. He went back he down to 175, he and he was never the same. Yeah, but he also, he didn't whittle John down. Like, he didn't say, John, you can't be over 220. That's ridiculous. It's the heavyweight. The weight class is that. Yeah. If you're going to be cruiserweight champ, the guy's got to be at the weight class. Just because he's a one pound over the weight class below, that is, that's obnoxious. I, I really hope that's not <laughs> what's going to happen. But point being, like, all right, so he goes up to 200 and he does it the, the legit way. And then mm-hmm. is that the end of his career or is he going to go back down to 168? That's ridiculous. That's 35 pounds or 32 pounds. Like, he shouldn't do that. No, no he's not going. He's not going to go up to two hundred. So, so if if he's smart, similar to what Roy Jones did, he's he's going to come in it very very naturally. One hundred eighty pounds. Canelo walks around up there. You know, he's in. Yeah, the, but he's, he's like my height. In, I'm not tall. He's in the seventies. He's, he's shorter. Yeah, he's like your height. He's he's going to be in the. He walks around in the seventies, seventy five, maybe even one eighty easily. And so I think he comes in at one eighty, one eighty one, one eighty two, and he fights a guy who's two hundred at, at the higher weights. It, it's it's it doesn't matter as much, um, but speed kills. And that's what Canelo has actually done really well with by moving up because he's fast. He's got quick hands. Wait. And he's able to utilize his counterpunching ability, his speed, to to beat the taller, bigger guys. And this is just another uh, opportunity to do that as well. But I, I Sherry kinda, Robinson yeah. did it with Joey Maxim, right? He moved up and he weighed exactly the same as he did for his last fight at middleweight. <laughs> and then he fought at 175. And he was literally, I think he was 159. And he fought at 175. He lost, but you know that was also like a million degrees, yeah, apparently. But I don't know what Canelo's going to do next. I mean, the 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 Jack one I think is far fetched, and we've seen him try to do this history thing. 
I don't think he knows to go, go through that anymore. The Bivol one, I still think is there's some hope for that. I think they're just posturing Canelo's side. I think Bivol wants it. He was at our party, <laughs> and I was like, "Hey, you gonna fight Canelo?" And he's like, "I, I don't know." Like, I, I think they are just waiting around because look around. Bivol yeah. has no one else to fight. So um, the Benavides one we just yeah, talked Benavidez, about. Better be, better be have is, is is tied up with uh, Callum Smith, which right. is uh, literally we don't know who's gonna come out of that. Um, but you know, the winner of that, I mean, that makes sense for Bivol. Right, and then there's Benavides, who we, who I just said is from what I've seen, is scheduled to fight Morel. So that $50 million offer was kind of like a clout thing, kind of get the headlines out there, kind of put Canelo in a bad light. And that leaves Charlo. Jamal Charlo, who I wanted Canelo to fight two, three years ago. I thought this yeah. was a marketable fight. I thought it was a good PBC uh, pay-per-view. I thought you could sell this fight. I thought it's intriguing. Uh, let's get Canelo back in, in the U.S. Let's get Canelo back on the pay-per-view uh, with Showtime Machine behind it. But Charlo hasn't fought in two years. Like... But out of all these options, I feel like it might be a Charlo or <laughs> oh, we see in two weeks with Berlanga. If Berlanga knocks out Quigley in, inside of five, six rounds and looks really good, he emerges. There's a lot going on. I don't like the Bader Jack fight. I like the Bivol one, I guess, better than Charlo. And I really don't like the Berlanga one. So if I was ranking them all. I think in order of, of probability, I would go Berlanga, uh, Badu, Charlo. Bivol last. And very, very close between one and two. And very wide for number three. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot going on. There's a lot going on in the sport. Canelo, um, we're seeing so much success in the sport and so much good fights. And, and that's without Canelo being in a big fight. And uh, none of these exactly are huge ones. We haven't seen anything with the heavyweights. But it's all the the, the, the smaller weights. So right up to, to 147 with Spence and Crawford. Great show, Chris. Awesome. We covered a lot of ground there. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Uh, oh, wait. I want one last thing before we say goodbye. We're closing in on the nine-year anniversary of Chris Algieri becoming a world champion. It happened June 14th, uh, 2014 at Barclays Center. When wow, Chris went from <laughs> man to legend, becoming mm. world champion, defeating Ruslan. So congratulations. I know it's a big day for you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I forgot the. I mean, we spoke about this last week, but I forgot that it was actually tomorrow. So, yeah, big, big, big day in in the in in history and upset of the year for 2014 for Ring Magazine and uh, life changing event for me and something I will never forget. That's and, why I love uh, saying except, former world champion Chris Algieri. Except I forget which eye it was a lot. <laughs> I, I always I always say I'm like ah, it's this one, it's this one, this one. There it is. Um, but yeah, no, it was uh, I haven't watched that fight in a while. Maybe I'll watch it tomorrow. That's awesome. You should. You deserve it, man. World champ. Uh, great show. Hope everyone uh, protect yourselves at all times. Keep your hands up. Go congratulate Chris Algieri on social media. We're out. Subscribe. 10,000 subscribers. <laughs> We're closing in on 10K subscribers. That's, that's on YouTube. On, to, on YouTube. Yeah, that's big. 9.28. Wow. It was like 9.22 before. Mm. Subs. Get those subs up. Let's go. We're not on the air anymore, are we? All right. Goodbye. Yeah.